Welcome to the Collective Awakening Podcast, creating a loving and sacred space to share truth and knowledge, bringing together from around the world like-minded souls who wish to share their truth and wisdom in this great time of conscious awakening. Hosted by Chris and Stephen of the Purple Mountain Spiritual Health and Wellbeing Centre. Okay, friends, welcome to the Collective Awakening podcast. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you once again. I'm Chris, uh, along with Stephen of the Purple Mountain Spiritual and Wellbeing Centre. And it's an absolute pleasure to welcome our guest on this episode, Mark Sargent. And we will be talking all things flat earth on this episode and more. So welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Uh, again, as I told you during the pre-show, I if anyone contacts me from the UK, I just immediately say yes to whatever it is. <laughs> uh, again, it's Amazing. Like, I, I, I do. I, I I had I've had students call me up. It's like I heard you say on a thing you'll 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 talk to anyone from the UK. I, Absolutely I will. I love the UK. <laughs> Fantastic to hear. And I'm just so excited for this subject. And uh like many, probably uh last couple of years, I think during what we'd call our first lockdown here to 2020 i watched behind the curve on netflix mm -hmm. uh, those watching might watch that and that was my first awareness of you and actually i found that one of the most interesting parts like the first half of that documentary yeah. uh, your story uh really drew me in and oh. i'd love you just to share that with us what brought you on this pathway and what drew your interest uh, and passion to what you're doing I got into this, and yeah, if you watch the Behind the Curve documentary, which is, I, I know everyone in our com in in my community, they hated it, and I knew they would because the people that made the film did not like us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the time they got to the end, and and they still to this day, like the the director uh, Daniel Clark, he swears he goes, no, Mark's a con man, he's he's faking it. There's no way he believes in this. It's like, dude, you spent seven months with me <laughs> How? <laughs> and not only that i've been doing this since 2015 it's like when am i going to reveal my my master plan you know um but i got into this uh back in uh, i looked into it in 2014 um i never never got married or had kids and if it, once you reach a certain age you you realize you have a lot of free time on your hands if you don't get married and have kids a lot of free time <laughs> and so and i was there when the internet was young you know back when you could finish the internet you guys aren't old enough to remember that but it was like you could actually be like is there any other pages i can go to <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like, I mean, there was only so many pages out there and i got into when youtube first came out uh and some of the other stuff and we won't go into all the other conspiracies you know for censorship reasons um, but I, I dug into just about every conspiracy you could think of. Um, I went to JFK, for example, in the theater back back in the day when when it came out in the early 90s. And I have an opinion on just about every conspiracy there is. And yeah. was just got conspiracy bored. I was like, I was out of things to look at. It's like, is there anything else that I haven't looked at? You know, did, did Bigfoot actually have Elvis's baby? Maybe? Is that a thing? <laughs> And finally, uh, you know, I looked at flat, you know, and I knew I was onto something because I looked, it's like, what's well, on my bucket list? It's like flat earth. Oh, I don't want to look at that. Just don't, <laughs> I don't want to look at it. And everybody knows. And, and, and then all of a sudden I clicked on a flat earth video that was recommended for me, you know, for some obscure reason back in 2014. Yeah. And I remember I was sitting in Colorado and I was alone in the living room with the drapes pulled. And I got visibly flushed. I was like embarrassed to click on this. I clicked on this. It's like, why am I getting hot? <laughs> What's, what the hell's wrong with it? It's like, look, you know, I was in the tech field for, for years and years and years. Plus, I was single. I clicked on a lot of weird stuff on the internet. Nothing embarrassed me. It's like, yeah, I probably shouldn't be on this site. But nothing at, at any point would be, you know, got me visibly just worked up and it's like and i caught myself i was like in this introspective moment and so it's like all right you know what i'm gonna do this i'm gonna spend a weekend on it and and uh, see if i can knock it out and after that weekend was over i realized I was like i got a lot more time than i need to spend 
So I spent uh, much longer than most people. I'm stubborn. Uh, so I spent nine months chewing on this thing. And as you know from the documentary, I mean, then I just had that weird, woke up in the middle of the night. And it was some of the clearest writing I've ever had uh, where I could, I remember getting up at like three in the morning and going and taking a shower and I could hear the narrative in my head. Not in somebody else's voice. It wasn't one of those crazy things, right? It was like, like a demon's voice. It's like, here's what you will write. No, it was it was my own voice. And I was going through paragraph after paragraph. I'm going, yeah, I can write this. Plus, I'm now leaning. I'm going to the other side of the scale. And uh, I'm going to look at it from the flatter side. And I sat down. I was just punching it out paragraph by paragraph. Never went back. It was, again, you, you know, writing, it's usually two steps forward, one step back. No, that was not happening. I mean, yeah, a few grammar things here and there, but I'm done and I'm finished it, you know, the first clue and I'm going, well, might as well narrate it. So I grabbed a, you know, a crappy gaming mic and, uh, and recorded it. And I mean, it felt kind of like you ever watch Forrest Gump. You remember that movie yeah. from back? Then? Remember when he was running cross country, right? It's like, well, got to the end. Might as well turn around and keep going. That's how it felt. <laughs> you know, it was like this is weird instinctive thing to where, I made the first uh, seven clues in eight days and took a little break. I mean, the, the process started over, you know, the next morning, got up early. Back then, I, you know, I didn't know anything about video editing. So I was like, I'll just crank, you know, I was learning as I, as I went and really thought. And then I think I, I thought, okay, I'm going to put my, my, all my contact information, hoping someone will come back and shoot it down. And the weirdest thing happened. People weren't shooting it down. I had just a, this, interesting assortment of people from subject matter experts to media to just people out of the blue calling up it's like yeah man i want to know more about this and then subject you know pilots and, and air traffic controllers and people stuff they didn't talk about in the documentary but they're going yeah man it's not that crazy here's why and then of course media the call was like okay you might be crazy tell me you know what's what's going on <laughs> And then the next thing you know, things started snowballing and more people got on board and, and people were, all these channels were popping up where, where people, you know, people in the documentary like Globusters and Jaron and, and Patricia and stuff like that. And they were, everyone was making all this stuff and, and it's like, what is happening to where the next thing you know, um, uh, you, you know, 2019, for example, I, I think I did conferences in seven countries for for this and well okay and real quick we were talking pre you know pre-lockdown i was on my way we, we could do no wrong i was on my way to go back to london for a third time to shoot a mcdonald's commercial for pancake day because it's apparently a thing over there pancake day yeah pancake day yeah, yeah. yeah. on in February, yeah. it's there amazing you know. amazing day uh, <laughs> well you're a fan i had no idea and they said, well, it's round, it's flat, it'd be perfect. You know, and it's like it was gonna happen. And I'm going, yeah, this is gonna be so cool. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> borders closed. And uh, and that was it. And then we didn't do anything for two years. So uh, but yeah, it's been an amazing, amazing journey. And uh, I wouldn't have wouldn't have changed a thing so far. So yeah. I just want to yeah. ask you there, Mark, what's really, really interesting, you know, people tapping into the podcast t tonight. Yeah. Uh, what is actually, what what do we mean by flat earth? So sh I think it's really good to start there. What What is the theory on the flat earth? What, what are we talking about? Earth? Okay, you are not living, okay, mainstream science says you're on this tiny little rock covered in a little bit of water and even a smaller amount of gas that's flying through an impossibly huge universe like four different directions simultaneously at, at incredible speeds. You know, uh, not only is the Earth supposedly spinning a thousand miles an hour, but it's going around the sun at 60,000 miles an hour. And the, the whole solar system is flying sideways like a dinner plate at half a million miles an hour and then going around, um, you know, the, the, other, the galaxies at two million miles an hour. And our model is that you're not going anywhere. You are basically living in a building, a snow globe. For, for lack of a better term. Uh, everyone knows what a snow globe is. I mean, I could say planetarium, yeah. but that kind of dates me. In terrarium, not everybody has lizards or tarantulas. Uh, and so you're living in a, in, a, in, a, in a building that is monstrous, absolutely monstrous. And we didn't, even our best and brightest, uh, didn't figure it out until about 1960. And when they figured it out, they're like, yeah, we're not really telling people. 
because because civilization had already been put in place and we'll probably talk about that but mm -hmm. yeah you're living you're living in a building let's say a snow globe and inside this snow globe is a big saltwater lake and inside that saltwater lake are a bunch of really really big islands which are known as the continents and around the outer edge is antarctica and antarctica is the only continent that does not look like you would describe it on the map it's not yeah. uh this forgive the phone i'm not picking that up uh uh it's not this island continent that looks about the same size of australia it's this yeah something that's way way bigger that stretches around the entire outside and people because people come back and say well how does the water not fall off it's like this isn't asgard right mm. it's uh you're you're talking about an island or you're, you you know this the same thing I'll, I'll steal a line from david weiss where it's like okay how does water not fall off of a lake it's like well because you have a border i go yeah same same thing you have a border yeah. um the stars and the sun and the moon are basically just lights in the sky and what's outside of it we don't know but there is no space as far as you know every space has been defined by you know to us by mostly different space programs um but you're living in something you know a planetarium the the argument and i know i don't even know if the nearest planetarium to you guys is but you go to a planetarium and you see mm. and people say okay you know can you see the jupiter up there yes i can does it look spherical yes it does can you land on it no why not well because it's just light on a ceiling Who's to say that you're not just living in a much, much bigger thing? I mean, come on. The power of, of, of Hollywood and illusion, we can do incredible things right now, visually. Uh, and that's where we are. So how's that? Pretty good? Yeah, that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. What, what's really interesting when you were talking before, when you explained about your journey, how, you know, once, you know, you, you, you've done your writing and you got your message out there, yeah. how people sort of came to you. And did you say like pilots and people that actually worked on with oh, airplanes yeah. and stuff came to you? I found that really, really fascinating how how a lot of people, and I find when we were getting into, me and Chris were very big on anti-fracking, mm -hmm. how a lot of the media and the media really clever trying to sort of make us all look like hippies and we're stupid and we're unintelligent. Actually, a lot of people, very, very clever people will be interested in this kind of thing and believe it as well. We're not all stupid. We are very academic. We are very intelligent. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and like one of the first, I've got, I've, you know, I've, I've recorded all of them, almost all. If I, again, I, people have heard this before. If I ever write an autobiography, it'll be called Unsolicited because mm. nobody, I, I mean, I, di I didn't have to pick up the phone. That was how I knew there was something going on here is that people just kept calling me and kept calling me. I never had to reach out like the, the one of my first subject matter experts was a, um, a Navy United States Navy missile instructor for the Sparrow missile system. And he'd been doing it, you know, training people on it for 10 years. And he comes out, you know, out of the blue. And I, I, I said, look, I can make you anonymous. He's like, no, man, I'm not going to be anonymous for this. And it's like that's that's really awesome and uh he even took probably shouldn't have uh took video from inside the the training facility for for this and i i don't know if it was classified but i, I didn't get in trouble for it which is nice but you know, he was one of the first people to say along with a lot of other military people it's like no matter what weapon you use whether it's a cannon or a missile or a torpedo or whatever he goes the, um, the curvature of the earth and the spinning of the earth is never factored into um the firing solution ever he goes, it's in the manual. It's mentioned. It's like, oh, yeah, we heard about it. We never use it. It's like it's like one of those things that has just been glossed over for years and years and years. No different than um, putting the globe in the classroom mm -hmm. of every student. I don't know if they do it over where you guys are, but yeah. in the States, we put the globe in the classroom uh, when you're in first grade. And basically, we'd leave it there. It's in the corner for 12 years until you graduate. One of the right. finest pieces of conditioning ever. I mean, we have people here that will join the military because the flag's sitting in the corner for 12 years. It's like, oh, yeah, it's the flag. It's, it's, where I, it's where I live. I'm willing to fight for it. And then the globe down there, it's like, oh, yeah, it's the globe. It's where I live. I'm willing to defend it. And and people get really riled up about it. It's it's pretty amazing. Yeah. What's really interesting there, Mark, because I want to ask you one more question there, Chris. I know you want to chip in, is what I find really fascinating. So, the you know, you talk about this dome. We're all in this dome, Mark. Right. What do you think we are here as a human civilization? Why we, do you think we're here? Why are we in this dome? Do you think there are thousands of other domes? Oh, what, why, what, what, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Why, why, would, the, why would this be a one-off? 
Yeah, did you mean... think it's friend? Do you think it's friends from other worlds, aliens involved in this? Oh or... yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the um, okay. First off, uh, yeah. Oh boy, there's a couple different ways we could go here. Uh, <laughs> fir first is I don't think let's let's start with just us, which is do I think we're the first people to rent this apartment? No, not not by a long stretch. I mean, granted, I was one of the few people I think that bought the the first six or seven se seasons of Ancient Aliens on DVD. But but they had some points, which yeah. was our unbroken civilization only goes back five thousand years. But there's a lot of stuff out there that predates us. A lot. I mean the the Bosnian pyramids, the real pyramids, Puma Punku, uh, Machu Picchu, uh, the Bimini Road, um, the sunken cities off of Japan, the sunken cities off of India. There's just so many. And if, of course, why why would we be arrogant to think we're the first people here, right? Mm -hmm. um, which I also direct, you know, if you if you think about UFOs, um, do I think do I do I think there's things flying around up there? Yeah, you bet. And they're not us, even though the American government would love to take credit for it because that's what we do. You know, and it's like, oh yeah, it's probably one of our top secret military. It's like, no, it isn't. Come on, they've been around for a long, long time. Uh, one of my favorite UFO sightings, you can look it up, it's even got its own wiki entry, um, uh, isn't Roswell or Aurora, Texas, or it's um, 1561 Nuremberg, Germany. It's absolutely brilliant. If anyone hasn't looked it up, please do, um, which is on a beautiful April morning in Nuremberg, Germany, two huge factions, you know, might as well have been the Sharks and the Jets, just show up with these flying aircraft carriers and just start hammering on each other above the city. For an hour, right? Now, granted, they could get away with it because there was no photography back in 1561, but there's plenty of people that could draw, and they did. They had a whole hour. So they're drawing everything. They're having their toast and schnitz and glubin or whatever they eat. <laughs> and, they, and by the time they're done, what was creepy, though, and ancient aliens didn't even talk about this. This is the part that bothered me. They, they leave things out, and I think because it gives too much credibility to the story. So these, fa these two factions are beating each other up for, two, for an hour. And then a single black giant angular ship shows up in between them, doesn't do anything. Those guys scatter, and then that ship hangs around for a little bit and then veers off and, and takes off. Now, the reason why I think ancient aliens left that out is because it, it raises too many questions of, of a hierarchy. It's like, okay, first off, who were the first the, the two? Why were they battling over a major city? I think they figured out there was a dead spot. That they could fight over, and no one was going to see him for a while. Who were who was the black ship? I mean, were they the cops? Were they the UN? Who the hell were those guys? And why were the other two? Obviously, didn't want to mess with them. But the, also, the 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 part which bothered me was um, the response time—a full hour to get that you know to get the the cops there. It's like, look, I can fire a gun out this window. There's going to be cops here in five minutes, right? A full hour of military engagement. It's just, it was stunning. Anyway, um, to back back on point us so the the big question is are there and i by the way you can go out with night vision binoculars all day long and watch things flying around in the sky all day long it's st stunning how how many things there are flying around up there are they with us in here are they trapped in here with us or are they allowed to go outside of here and go to other places i don't know I, I don't know whatever whoever they are though uh there's different factions and they have rules obviously you, you can't and because it's one of the old ufo arguments which is why hasn't a ship landed in downtown london you know why didn't in piccadilly and just you know got out take some selfies sign some autographs and and shake hands it's like because it would change everything you know you you it would alter human it's the basically the prime director from star trek yeah. you don't you don't do that um but as far as other bubbles, you know, other snow globes outside of here, sure, why, why wouldn't you? I mean, if you have the power, if you have the engineering ability to make one of these, then you should have, you know, you know, here's here here's a you know sort sort of a moderate modernistic state, but there's others. Oh, hey, these guys are pre-industrial. Oh, hey, these guys are in, you know, barely <coughs> sticks and stones, and so on and so on. So does that sort of answer part of your? Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah. The first part of your question, I think, was where's my juice? Oh, it's over there. I'll get it later. The um, uh, the first part of uh was why. Well, you know why why you know why build something like this was which was a uh, is yeah. kind of a big question. Um. 
All right. You want me to get into sort of the existential part of this? Um, yeah. All right. Give me a second. I'm gonna grab. I'm gonna grab my juice. I'm gonna. Uh, okay. Stop. Well, this, hang on. This, this is going to be good then if he's uh, he's just hydrating for this for this question so he can be prepared. Oh, uh, it's be <laughs> so it's going to be good. <laughs> okay. So sorry. I got to <laughs> okay. The reason was, I, by the way, I turned off my camera because I'm wearing shorts right now. I'm doing the old newscaster thing. <laughs> Where... I, I thought that was just me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I could be lying and saying, I'm not wearing anything. But that's yeah. not true. <laughs> Either way, it wouldn't look as good. Okay, so why do it? Why build something like this? Uh, I'm a big believer in dualism which is you can't yeah. fully appreciate one thing without the opposite. So, which is why trust fund kids get so screwed up. You know, kids are spoiled rotten, you know, the Royals. Right? So yeah. you can't have light without shadow, uh, hot without cold, pain without pleasure. You don't appreciate any of those things unless you see the opposite of it, you know, in, in, in moderation. So I try to explain to people, I, I, try, I use, and this has been covered in different, this is an absolutely new concept. It's been covered in different um, science fiction stories. Even a Twilight Zone episode touched on this briefly, which was, um, let's say you had a genie's lamp. In fact, there's a new movie coming out touching along those lines. I'm really anxious to see it with uh, Tilda Swinton and uh, Idris, Idris uh, Alba. Is that his name? Yeah, Idris Alba, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, apparently he's the genie. So genie shows up and he gives you three wishes, but you're clever. You remember what to do if you ever get three wishes, right? Ask for more wishes. You could ask for a million wishes, I suppose. No one ever makes it to a million, and I'll tell you why. Um, I believe the, the universe sort of runs off of novelty in, in, in certain ways to power it. I mean, um, Einstein said uh, a long time ago, uh, he said, imagination is more important than knowledge. That always puzzled me coming from a, a physicist, right? And he's like, why would imagination be more important than knowledge? You'll see why in a second. So the, you get a million wishes and you start rattling off stuff, right? Of course, most people are, are dumb and they wish for money almost immediately, followed by, oh, I want to date this actor or actress or whatever it is. Okay, so fine. You, if you're smart, you go for immortality, uh, you know, perfect health. You, you get to change your looks and make you look however you want and you date everyone you want to be you become a rock star you become a prince you become a pirate whatever it is and you start running down the list right you're going burning through the wishes burning through the wishes problem is eventually you're going to run out of ideas because you know if you ask for immortality or whatever if, if time if time and space isn't an issue kind of like why they don't put clocks in casinos Things start getting weird because you're you're compressing time to where time is is meaningless. So eventually you start running out of ideas and you go to the genie and you're going, hey, you know, I've been everything, I've done everything. I hell, I sat on a beach with margaritas for 150 years. It got a little stale. And you're you're wondering what to do. And the genie says, Well, I got something. You're not going to really like it much, but it's going to change everything. It's like, all right, give me the pitch. The pitch is this. I'm going to send you to a place. Limited lifespan, unlimited ways to die, mostly suffering. In fact, the world is 99.9% .9 conflict. It doesn't matter how beautiful you are, how powerful, how talented, you know, there's always something to complain about. Always. And it's like, wow, that sounds terrible. Why would I go there? And it's like, well, because once you're done with your 70 or 80 years or whatever you want to do, you're going to come back here and everything will be brand new. It'll be absolutely awesome. It's like, wow, that sounds great. What's the catch? Because there's always a catch, right? And the genie says, well, you're not even going to remember we had this conversation. And he snaps his fingers Thanos style and voila. You are here. And the reason is, again, I know we're kind of going off and in, into the weeds here, but the reason is, is because you have to have your memory wiped is because of the, what's the old uh, metaphor? You can't have your cake and eat it too. I always thought it was a stupid saying. You can't have your cake and eat it too and still have your cake, which then gets into a whole nother thing. But you can't have your life 
the way it is now and remember what it was before you got here because it completely changes the tone. It loses it, the, the whole relevance, which is why I don't think virtual reality will be able to go that far because once virtual reality plugs into the old noodle, uh, then then this world, this, this life becomes meaningless, you know, in a sense. It changes the perspective. So that's why you would build something like this. That's in my opinion. Um, it's cyclical, meaning you spend five, it was round, 5,000 years in an unlimited universe, 80 years here, 5,000 years in another years. This, this world is, it's not a necessary evil. It's necessary to, to, to give you perspective. And so that's. Oh, that, well, Mark, how you describe that. And, you know, me and Chris talk about it all the time. We all speak the same truth, but in a, in a very different way. And we believe very similar to that about reincarnation, really? about how we know we've all reincarnated on this earth for a purpose. And when, we're not supposed to remember and the duality between light and dark. And it's very similar to actually our beliefs, which is actually really, really interesting, isn't it, Chris? I, I mean, a lot of the other people in my community don't talk about that uh, mm. because the, the question does come up. It's like, why build something like this? Why do it? And I'm not, I'm not shy. I'll, I'll answer it. And it's like, yeah, well, I mean, because, and the reason I'll, I will, will volunteer to answer it is because the only way I got to the whole flat earth concept was I had to put my, I had to answer for myself everything that I thought people would ask me. And so I, not only that, but I, I'm, I'm a big believer of empathy. You know, put yourself in the other person's shoes, which is how I qualified conspiracies. So that, that's a whole nother thing, which is, and again, I won't name the conspiracies necessarily, unless you, you want me to, which is, I will, I'm one of the few people that, that will say, okay, let's say I was a part of the Illuminati, right? You know, let's say, let's say I was part of some dark, sinister, you know, government group that sits in a, in a big oblong table with 40 watts of light and apparently everybody smokes. I don't know why that's portrayed as that. <laughs> that, that apparently that's, that's the formula. But when I, when I do, I say, don't look at conspiracies the way, you know, as some that it, it's all evil and horrible because you know because you know there's people with black hats twirling handlebar mustaches and and thinking about world domination most of the time from what i can tell to steal a line from um, hot fuzz which is uh, it was done for the greater good right yeah. that's, that's generally what it is the people don't understand that the greater good is usually done at high levels because the lower levels can't ever agree on anything nobody wants to be Nobody wants to be, it's like, well, we're going to have to sacrifice four or five pawns on this board to win this game. No one wants to be those pawns. No one ever, ever volunteers to be those pawns. And so that's how I qualify most conspiracies. If I couldn't improve, I, I, you know, it's like, okay, if I was the Illuminati, why would I do this conspiracy? If I couldn't improve on it, then I generally, and I know that's giving me too much credit, I, but I've always been a pretty, fairly clever problem solver. So if I couldn't improve on it, it's like, oh yeah, it's probably legit. And there's what, and I can tell you why. I mean, people don't like to hear it. Most of the, you know, they don't like to hear it. It's like, yeah, it's just matter of fact reason. That's, that's why it's happening. So, so do you think, Mark, do, do you think, Mark, then they're sort of getting my head around the, the, the whole flat earth, which I can accept. Yeah. So it's not these, um, these dark spirits, this dark agenda that's controlling the flat earth. It's, there is a higher power it's part of our experience, human experience, part of our consciousness. Is that what you're saying? Or... Yes. Yes. Right. But keep, okay. But keep it a secret. Well, why? Why? Why keep it a secret? Well, if you don't, that because people in, there's there's certain rules of power, and one is is that you don't people in, at certain levels of power do not take chances. Actually, organized crime does the same thing. There, there's a great line from, oh, was it Goodfellas? I know I'm using a lot of movie quotes. Pop culture references is one of my things. Um, <laughs> which is, I think Robert De Niro said it. Oh, no, it was in Heat. It was in Heat where he said, if there's ever a doubt, there is no doubt. Mm. Meaning you, you, you take measures to ensure that you don't have any doubt in your mind, whatever that is. So... Let's say you 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 know you don't figure this out until about 1960 because you just don't have the technology. Remember, 100 years ago we barely had planes, and so um, in 1960 you figured this out. 
you know, you have the old maps. That, you know, I try to tell people, I was like, look, the king of France, let's pick on France, had um, had the maps in, uh, oh, I don't know, 14, you know, 1600, right? If he's actually, you know, actually had the snow globe, you know, someone put it down. It's like, that's where you are. What could he do about it? He had, he had um, wooden ships and he had horses. That's, that's all he could do. Until you have the, the tech, you know, the planes and the tractors and the, and the, and the heavy diesel ships, you're not going to be able to do anything. So if 1960, if they find out, it's not what they stand to gain, it's what they stand to lose. Remember, the, the most powerful or the most valuable currency in the world is, is information. Always has been. Yes. You know, whatever it is, you know, especially for if you have information that other people don't have. You know, go into the Rothschild conspiracy, a great example of that, um, which is so if all of a sudden you figure out that the world is a snow globe, right? 1960, what could go wrong? Imagine the Illuminati meeting, everybody's smoking. It's like, okay, what could go wrong? Uh, it's threefold. Uh, one is academic. Every university in uh, the world, in every country uh, would have to retool everything. I mean, it would just be chaos in the universities. I mean, forget about astro I was gonna say astrology, astronomy and uh, astrophysics. That that'd have to be torn down, and I don't even know how to recover. But uh, the remaining ones, oh, ge geology, biology, archaeology, um, geology, whatever it is, right? They 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 would all have to be retooled. That's just academics. Uh, world markets, economics would would have to all the, all the stock markets would have to shut down for months until you figure out what may you know what may happen um but the big one is religion um which is the you know the five <clears throat> excuse me five major religious houses of this world um buddhism hinduism um judaism islam and christianity you're giving them leverage against science simultaneously right those five yeah. groups control what 80 percent of the population no Oh, definitely. Yes, definitely. That, and that, yeah. And you're telling them, oh, yeah, yeah, we know that science has been beating you over the head with textbooks for five centuries at least, but you probably should show some restraint, right? You no, it's the same groups that, you know, they, they have no problem with words like burning, <laughs> you know, and so they would, um, they'd come straight at science and they'd say, okay, so you were wrong about something really, really important. What else are you wrong about? Well, I don't know. How about uh, evolution and carbon dating and the Big Bang theory and dark matter and just about every theory we've had over the last fifty years? It, it, science would never be able to recover. So that Illuminati meeting becomes very, very short at the end, where it's like, "So, do we tell people?" <laughs> and the guy at the end laughs and goes, "No, no, we're not telling anybody. We're going to keep this between us. In fact, let's lock down Antarctica." permanently <laughs> so mm. except for you know some people that want to get pictures taken with penguins let's lock, let's lock it down it's the only unbroken treaty in the history of anything and then they militarized space uh and then the americans pretended to go to the moon and people bought it i i asked by the way i give i will give credit where credit is due you know because there's a japanese space program and the euro space program and, and the chinese and the russians and us i think it's like five countries which apparently are launch capable even though israel supposedly went but that's a whole nother thing you know who didn't get into it you guys the uk didn't i think that whole stiff upper lip british dignity type thing kicked in i think at the highest level british like yeah, we're not faking that. <laughs> you guys can do whatever you want. We're not doing any of it. Oh, yeah, we'll throw a couple of people on your space station. But a, a British space program? No. no. And in fact, I'll even go so far as um, there was a British, one of the British directors that directed, uh, I think it was Diamonds Forever, uh, one of the James Bond, Sean yeah. Connery films, where if you remember it, it, and it was a while back, but Sean Connery was, was running through a Hollywood film set and he runs through a fake moon set. And no one really even talked about it. And the astronauts in the fake moon set couldn't catch him because they were still in character and they were running in slow motion and they couldn't catch him. <laughs> like it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. So yeah, it, you know, uh, Mark, Mark, sorry. Sorry, no, go ahead. I find that around. really interesting, uh, Mark. I just wanted to pick up the point about uh, Antarctica. Yeah. And it's something I wasn't aware of. Uh, and I, I think I caught it on, on something when I was looking and just uh, refreshing my mind about this subject. And can you tell us a bit more about the agreement and who can step foot on Antarctica and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and why you can't? So in 
A little backstory behind that. Uh, the Antarctic exploration, most of it was done by a Navy admiral called Admiral Byrd. And I don't think they talked about him much in the uh, in the documentary. But uh, he went down there and basically from 1920, 20, what did I say? 1929, basically the better part of 30 years. You know, he went, he was the first man to, to fly apparently around the North Pole. And you're thinking, wow, you know, he's going to spend some time. It's like, no, whatever he found in the North Pole, immediately the, the United States Navy said, okay, you're going to the South to, to basically Antarctica. And he flew, just flew, he flew his own planes. And he flew bigger and bigger planes for better part of 30 years. And then during Operation Deep Freeze, uh, 55 to 56, he finds something, something which we still don't know. I mean, Antarctica, you get, sorry, back up even a little bit more, which was there was all sorts of countries exploring Antarctica all the way up until World War II. And then everybody left Antarctica except for one country, Nazi Germany. And if you remember your Indiana Jones, right? People thought, oh, you know, the Germans will do anything to win the war. Oh, yeah, they would do anything to win the war. They were one of those groups. If Harry Potter's wand was somewhere in, you know, in the middle of the jungle, they're sending people to go get it. If the Ring of Power is somewhere, they're going to go find it. The Ark of the Covenant? Oh, hell yeah. They were going after it. So while everyone else was fighting World War II, Nazi Germany was down in Antarctica doing stuff you know do mysterious mysterious things so right after world war ii ended um admiral Byrd, right at right after the surrender of uh, of japan they went he took a full-blown carrier fleet down to antarctica called operation high jump not classified Five thousand men support ships the whole nine yards and we don't know what happened there but, you know, there's a lot of speculation they were trying to root out the last of the Nazis. But whatever happened in 1950, by 1954, it was over because he went on television and was talking about how uh, there's going to be all these countries down there for the next hundred years. And they're going to be fighting over minerals. And there's a mountain range made out of coal and there's oil and there's, min you know, uranium, the whole nine yards. And he was actually worried. He's like, well, we might even, you know, get into a conflict down there. And then the next thing you know, he goes to Operation Deep Freeze. And whatever he found, I think he found part of the outer marker, which was, you know, the, the, you know, the edge of the snow globe, you know, at least was within striking distance. At that point, he comes back and he was going to go on another media tour and he died of a heart attack uh, back at his home in Massachusetts. Maybe suspicious, maybe not. If you look at the guy, it looked like a picture of health. I mean, career military man, nothing seemed to be wrong with him. Uh... And then in 1959, almost immediately after that, they start working on what's known as the Antarctic Treaty. Uh, and you can find it. There's PDFs easy to find on, online. And is the only unbroken treaty in the history of treaties, which says that no corporation from anywhere can set up shop in Antarctica forever. And to your fracking thing, I, I joke about with people. I go, look, in the United States, we can start fracking in, in your neighbor's backyard in a week. <laughs> It does not take long to do because all you have to do is, you know, start throwing briefcases of money at people and they absolutely will do it. Um, and yet those same companies, huge amounts of liquid assets cannot touch Antarctica. Uh, in fact, I've used um, British Petroleum as an example many a time. It's like not only are they not allowed to go down there, they're not allowed. Here's the red flag for me. This is what really got me into the whole you know, really pushed me in deep into the into the rabbit hole, which was, you're not allowed to talk about it. So if you're British Petroleum, you could run full page ads in the London whatever newspaper, and every month saying how great it would be to have us set out the jobs and you know economic security and all this stuff. You're not even allowed to do that. When since when has that ever happened? And it's like, oh yeah, I know exactly how that played out. You know, some government official goes to the head of British Petroleum and they say. So you're not going down there and it's under the under national security blanket. I can't tell you why. And uh, when you finally retire, whoever comes in, give him my business card because I'm going to tell him the same thing. And that's it. That is that is all that that, that she wrote. And, and to this day, um, I think at any given point, there's less than 5,000 people in Antarctica. Nobody owns it. Nobody owns Antarctica, which is stupid staggering you know everybody owns every inch of real estate outside of antarctica but this massive continent nobody owns anything um 
and nor corporations. The only people that are allowed to go down there are military, military scientists, and uh, the occasional tourist. I mean, you can pay, I think in British pounds, I think it's around 13,000 British pounds to, to take a trip down there. And it is extremely hostile. You know, it is, it, in fact, the, the whole continent screams go, go away. Most people don't know that most of the continent sits above 14,000 feet. This whole, you know, imagine, imagine something the size of Australia, but almost nothing's at sea level, which, you know, altitude sickness kicks in at, at 7,000 feet. And it's just, it's just an amazing, amazing place. And to this day, the only cool thing I ever really that gleaned out of, out of that was, if you remember some years ago, I've got the video on my channel. They pulled it since. You remember when Fitbits came out? Those stupid wristwatches. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And you, I, I say stupid and you're probably wearing one. The, uh, the, <laughs> no. the, the Fitbits came out and people were, people didn't, didn't understand that, that some, um, well, some people did. It's like, oh yeah, you they can track where you jog or your cycle or wherever. So it's like, oh look here, I rode around London. Here's my path, right? Has a little built-in GPS system on it. People didn't get that that because it was a new technology. You know, we we miss things. You know, we especially in America, we de we develop stuff and we don't realize the implications. Basically, military guys were wearing these, right? And they only track guys on the ground. But all of a sudden, we have the nerds over here, and they don't miss anything. It's like, hey, look, here's a Fitbit map. You could also see what other people are doing. Now, you can't figure out what they're doing by name, but you can see their pattern. And all of a sudden, we were seeing we were seeing patterns you know, of people that were doing things in areas of the deserts where there's no roads. <laughs> there's no anything. They're basically secret military bases that people were running patrols on. But there were also a couple in Antarctica big ones really big ones where you know the, i mean the the path was just freaking monstrous and there's nothing out there you zoom in there's nothing there but snow and then all of a sudden fitbit's like oh yeah we should probably shut this down and so they uh they i think they restricted you know they turned it off for certain areas but anyway sorry there's my long-winded antarctica thing no it's really uh i'm sure a lot of people found that really interesting our listeners i certainly did uh, yeah look, look it up hey, antarctic treaty 1959 you can look if anyone wants the pdf seriously you can type into google you can absolutely find it or you can email me and i will give it to you yeah and this this is what i like about the subject we're talking about uh because it encourages us to question what we're presented with and i, I don't think there's anything wrong with that i've said a million times on this podcast uh, it's only a lie that doesn't like to be questioned the right. truth doesn't mind at all um so i feel that's so important to talk about these things um but what i want to ask you is yep. backtrack a little bit yep. to the moment that you uh, really clicked on to the flat earth theory now what was that point what was the piece of evidence or the fact that you came across was like that's it um well the the there's three three little points the the part that uh, the, the Jerry Maguire moment that got me to build the clues was just the fact that I couldn't that I couldn't use NASA to defend the globe anymore. I Meaning everyone goes to NASA. Oh, it's like NASA can prove and knock it down in two seconds. <clears throat> and you, you imagine metaphorically, you know, these there's a warehouse full of boxes, you know, with NASA on it, and you go keep going through more and more. It's just empty boxes with a few pieces of packing popcorn. That was the 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 moment for me where I was running into I couldn't no matter what I did to try to defend the globe because I'm a, I was a huge globe fan I used to collect antique globes from eBay I'm not kidding you you know I, I was fascinated with it with the icon and I had world maps all over my walls um, but that's that's what got me into it was wasn't any particular topic was that I couldn't find I couldn't find the silver bullet to kill flat Earth. And since I couldn't do that, I said, okay, again, the, the clues that I made were basically just a cry for help, <laughs> which is I made them and put them out there. That's why I put out my contact information. It's like, somebody call me. I didn't want to sound like I was just weird, but I, but I might as well have just said, somebody call me, tell me what I'm doing wrong here because I can't prove the globe in a court of law anymore. The, um, the part that got me to continue the clues was the Antarctic Treaty. The, the, the part I was just telling you where, again, money rules the world right capitalism we won't talk about russia or anything else capital i mean that's kind of a joke anyway russia loves money as much as the next guy um but the the fact that 
greed and money and power run everything, and yet those same three forces couldn't crack Antarctica. Meaning somebody at some point had to say, yeah, I don't care how many trillion dollars we might make off resources. Nobody's going. Oh, you, I'm sorry. Let me, let me throw this in here real quick, which is the, the big reason why you lock down Antarctica is because of the money. So you have British Petroleum or Exxon or Mobil or all these companies that are down there doing stuff. Well, what if one of their planes goes off course? What if one of their helicopters goes off? Because you know they're gonna. I mean, the land markers are not great out there. You know, somebody's gonna get lost yeah. in the snow. And then, and that's that's the discussion somebody at the big long table has. It's like, so what do we do there? It's like, well, we'll have to clean it up, some loose ends. It's like, yeah, and how many times are we gonna do that before people start talking? It's like, what happened to these workers? What happened to that plane? What happened to this? And so finally, whoever the head honcho is at the end, it's like, you know what? Just freaking lock it down put some big chains i don't care just don't tell people like there's frost giants or anything like that don't mention game of thrones it'll be fine and they did the same thing sorry i, I will get to your point about the my, my biggest uh, flat earth proof um but uh, they did the same thing with the moon missions which was the american moon missions there were no stars in any of the photos ever and i don't care how many times a, a photographer said well it's an exposure setting it's like so change the exposure setting. You're going to bring, but then they double down it and the astronauts you know, during press conference, well, we didn't see any stars. It's like, that's a bunch of crap. So eventually you, you kind of like the baby with the bathwater thing where, you know, at one point someone says no stars. And the reason why you can't show stars in any of the moon missions is because it takes one nerd because remember they're, they're date and time stamped all the photos. And all of a sudden, one nerd works up the model and's going, "Yeah, you know the belt of Orion? It's right there. Should be over there." Okay, you can only do that a few times before all of a sudden it's like, "So is the date time stamp system completely screwed up?" And and then you have to answer that. So somebody says no stars. Um, but sorry, my biggest proof for um, the flat Earth, the thing, but was it was after I made the clues, and probably at least a year and a half that really got me into it um, was the um, gravity versus the vacuum of space, which is uh, something that the movies do, which is, you know, th things are done for dramatic effect in movies, right? Uh, yeah. There's what, what's the, what's the uh, Mark Twain, Mark, the, the humorist Mark Twain. He said, um, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And he's right. Right. I mean, we do it in hall in Hollywood all the time. It's like, and you know, like, like movie, movie blood, a great example. Movie blood is never the right color. It's always red. Always, always, always. Why? It's because people don't understand that when large amounts of blood dry, it's like a scab. It dries black. Right. But they tried that in the movie. It's like people's like, why is there all that black stuff on his shirt? Like, oh God. Fine. Just freaking make it red. Right. <laughs> Even though it should be black. Um, same thing with pressure. So gravity versus the vacuum of space. So it's not like, so in every time you see like a space movie, if they're in, in a vacuum, you know, it's space, if there's a hole in the hole or whatever it is, you always hear this. And people are like, get the duct tape. We only have two minutes of air left, right? And any submarine guy at any deep water scenario, you know, pressure person will tell you, it's like, no, no, it's not like that. It's instant. It's absolutely horribly instant. Um, look up. Uh, uh, there's a wonderful video uh, on it, um, not a violent or not a not a gross one, um, on YouTube called "Look Up." Uh, the Germans love doing this. It's called uh, "Vacuum versus Steel Rail Car," and they apply a vacuum field inside, not aluminum, steel rail car, and they it crushes like like a monster's hand just went <laughs> right. It's it's that fast. What's my point? My point is, if you have a second floor in your building right now, and you, you're upstairs is a small vacuum chamber, right? maybe 10 feet wide, who cares, right? You pop the valve on that thing. What happens? It's not, again, not like the movies. It's instant. It's absolutely, incredibly instant, where everything in your room is going to be equalized. It's the second law of thermodynamics, which says that pressure cannot exist next to non-pressure without a barrier, right? It's why um, if you watch any video on YouTube or TikTok or whatever, put anything in a vacuum chamber, anything like a football or a balloon or anything that, that has some sort of air, it's going to expand, expand and explode. Okay. So you just know that all your air just went upstairs from your, from your room right now. So when you go outside, why is our atmosphere still here? 
and your response, your only response, the only response you can give is gravity. And then I come back and I say, oh, you mean the same gravity that couldn't keep the air in your room from going upstairs? That gravity? So what happens? And I've, I've thrown this to scientists. They, they just deflect. They just go off into another direction. I go, what happens at the bleeding edge of space? What happens when our atmosphere ends and a vacuum begins? You know, the pure vacuum of, of space, if that's what you want to call it. And they, they don't have an answer. I go, doesn't it make more sense? Because remember, it's called atmospheric pressure for a reason, right? So doesn't that mean you're in a pressurized system? And, and mean, you know, again, I didn't come up with the law. It means it has to be a barrier. It has to be. I'll, I'll throw one more trendy one for you. Climate change. Doesn't the term greenhouse gas make more sense if it's an actual greenhouse? I never understood that. Even as a kid, I never understood that. They talk about old oh, fluorocarbons and everything rising, you know, he, you know, all, all helium, hydrogen, whatever rises up. And then it gets to a point and it just stays there. Okay. Well, why doesn't it go into space? And it's like, oh, maybe, maybe some of it does. I was going, yeah, but what about the rest of it? So that that's the biggest thing for me. I mean, for, but I'm um, sorry go back one which is the thing that gets most people the general population the thing that gets probably 90 percent of the people into our, into our groups uh is long distance long distance photography by far i didn't come up with it i don't remember who did but instinctually people just started running down to the beaches with hd cameras and shooting long distance over water and start calling me <laughs> saying dude i can totally see this lighthouse from 40 miles i can totally see this boat from blah blah i'm going and it's like, yeah, but water lays perfectly level. I'm going, and it's like, yeah, but here's the curvature of the earth, you know, the formula. And they, they started showing me this stuff. And sure enough, uh, they were correct, which was the curvature of the earth is a mathematical formula. And you shouldn't be able to see over a certain distance. And they could. And since every, lots of people live near water, I mean, most of the population lives near some body of water. In the States, we have a little more stuff but uh but yeah you shoot long distance over 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 water and you can see stuff so there you go wow. so yeah. um what i wanted to ask you about as well mark was uh the observation of flight patterns as well oh yeah in fact that was i gotta give credit there was a it was a british guy that tipped me off to that back in 2015 he goes he goes look <laughs> those mystery men it's like look at the long haul flights i can't say anymore click Right? It's like, okay, long haul flights. So what he was talking about is the long flights uh, that go from um, South America to Australia or U United States to New Zealand or something like that. When these flights, when you look at them on a globe, they take these weird high arcing angles and especially in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, notably, let's let's focus on those. If you're going from southern hemisphere to some of the southern hemisphere, like say um, uh, South America to or Africa to um, uh, Australia or New Zealand or something like that, they'll go over the equator. They'll go north all the way to like California and then go back down. And you and and but when you look at it on a flat Earth map, oh yeah, sorry, uh, um, the flat Earth map. If you guys want to know a top down what it looks like. Uh, just look at the UN flag. That's the easiest way to, to look at it. The UN flag, which is also the um, AE map, which is the azimuthal equidistant map, which is also the flat earth map are absolutely identical. But if you put that same flight path on that AE map, it becomes a shallow dog leg or almost perfectly straight. And it doesn't make any damn sense. In fact, we, we even may found, you know, we've been doing this for seven years now, where um, the emergency landings get even weirder. So, like, there was this wonderful flight from, I think it was Taiwan, I want to say Thailand or Taiwan, close enough, that was on its way to Los Angeles. And a woman all of a sudden went into labor. It's like, oh, boy. So, if you look at the flight path on a globe, it's like, oh, well, they're going to be going right past Honolulu, Hawaii, you know, great hospitals there. It's like, no, no, they diverted north to Anchorage, Alaska. And, and it's like, why, why would they go to Alaska? It doesn't even make sense, especially, you know. <laughs> Or something like this and when you look at it on a, on a flat earth map no that's where you go that was the closest airport was alaska even though honolulu on a globe map you know again you're going straight to los angeles you that should be it and uh, again hiding in plain sight it, it is absolutely brilliant and the way the pilots and the planes are set up 
Um, they don't pilots. It's a very precarious position for pilots. You let's say you're a pilot, right? You're a navigator, and you, you know most of it's automated now, anyway. But let's say you're bored and you figured this thing out. Who are you going to tell? Who are you going to go to? You know what? What do you? Yeah. You're really going to go to your airline or the FAA? It's like, yeah, man. I think the maps are wrong. I think it's fine. And we, in fact, we have pilots. There was one from KLM that got benched because of this, and I knew she was going to, but she didn't care. She's like, no. She says, I'm. I'm going to talk about this. I, I. I. I talked about it in a video. I said you would be better served. If you just said you were followed by a UFO for a couple hours, you know, yeah. because they will they will bench you for that, and yet you're going to come back. And I mean, she had to get a psycholo psychological evaluation for something like that. But the the between that and just the don't forget also that the GPS system. There's three parts to it. The GPS system, also known as the global positioning system, that's an American made system. DOD, Department of Defense. That is all military. That is all us. That's why it was invented in the first place. But really, all it is is a fake satellite program that's still running the old Loran system, which is our system. Uh, Loran, L-O-R-A-N, which is the um, the old ground-based radar system that they augmented with cell towers and other things. But you know this because even though there's supposedly 32 GPS satellites with blanket coverage, right? When a plane gets about 150 or 200 miles away from the nearest tower, right? And and it's not it's not even just like go, going off the coast of Africa or the coast of Australia. On the way to Hawaii from like San Francisco or Los Angeles, that plane, the, the latitude and longitude will disappear. And even though the plane is on screen, you know, the little icon still on screen, uh, the latitude and longitude um, go into estimated or approximated mode, which means... Kind of like what it, what it says. We know approximately where the plane is. Yeah, we don't know exactly where the plane is. The, but but as long as they keep heading on this path, they'll probably make it. And when they come within 200 miles of, of whatever their destination is, they can course correct wh when they do that. And it's amazing. Like, that's why if you're old enough to remember the um, uh, those 777s, uh, the one, one was a flagship that uh, went down in the um, Indian Ocean. Right, and, the, and they couldn't never found the black boxes or never wanted to talk about the black boxes. It's like, how'd you lose freaking triple seven? How? Well, there's, how been, yeah, there's, there's been a few cases, quite a few flights over the many years that have disappeared. Disappeared. A few, and, a few, a few years ago, it was that Asian one? Do you remember? And it, and it got lost in Australia somewhere. Yeah. And this and and they, they had GPS system, and they don't don't know where it went. I just, yeah. it, there is there is a lot of dodgy stuff out there that I think the the, the governments don't sort of help themselves. But what I find fascinating, Mark, mm -hmm. is that when you when you look at the maps uh, and stuff like that, and I spoke to Chris about this, two points to this, you never hear about Africa in any news or media. And the other thing is you never know about the Pacific, you know, the Pacific Ocean. And there's there's apparently thousands of islands and the other side of the world. And you hear nothing like that in in, in the maps yeah. or anything like that, which I find incredibly strange. The, the Pacific Ocean, a lot of people don't realize, is monstrous. It is absolutely, you know, the North Pacific, the South Pacific. In fact, even if, even on the globe model, you know, forget about the flat earth model even on the globe model you can you can turn the globe a certain way and it's nothing but ocean that you see it's that it's mm. that big uh i remember I had a i had a world map on my wall and i cut out you know just i just to fit it on the wall i remember i was cutting out i was like well i hope i don't have to cut, cut out continents right and i didn't i just cut out huge swaths of the, uh, the pacific ocean there's some people that say that there could be an entire massive continent that's that's hidden out there or a series of other smaller continents, you know, the size of New Zealand or maybe Australia, that um, that no one's run into because they're just kept a secret. You know, that uh, now is that possible? Sure. I mean, look at um, some of the later explorers like uh, Amelia Earhart, right? Who who went down? Uh, who you know, her plane eventually crashed, ran out of fuel. Uh, that made sense to me because if the maps are wrong, if the globe maps she was using are wrong, then yeah, she would have get, eventually got to this point. Where you, it's like, oh yeah, I can make it to this island it's X number of miles away, and it actually was further. And mm. she's, you know, that couldn't have been fun for her. She's like, where the hell is the island? 
then she had to ditch and who knows where where that ended up you're the bermuda triangle so what's your thoughts on that then how does oh. that fit into the flat earth the bermuda triangle is that um, sort of an older an older civilization that was way more tech heavy than us that had way more power than us uh um i mean not to necessarily rival the um the babylonians from genesis uh, who actually were building a structure to actually, to reach the ceiling, but these guys, whoever whoever was running, and and the Bermuda Triangle would have been part of the whole Bimini Road, as you know, the Atlantis, you know, thing, or maybe even the the continent of Mu or the remnants, who whatever, whatever whatever they've got out there, really, it for one, it inspired a lot of filmmakers, and everyone in that area knows it's just one of those things now where we just don't go there. You know, pilots, especially pilots, are like, yeah, we're not. The the if you remember, there's two two quick things. One, the, it was the Flight 19 incident. You know, the 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 Navy bomber pilots. You know, after yeah. World War II, they were yeah. on a training run and they got lost. And that was covered in um, Colts and Cowards of the Third Kind, where they you know they found the planes. That's not the part that got me. The part that got me, which is usually omitted from most things, was the Osprey that got lost looking for them. And that was an, an Osprey plane. If you know what that is, that's a flying boat. It's one of those planes that can uh, that can land on water. That's the whole point. It takes off on water and it then lands on water. And it was um, it has like a crew of nine, right? And you got to remember, even if they ran out of gas, they can land on the water. And that mm. disappeared without a trace. And that's when the Navy just went full tilt and sent out everything they had. And of course, none of those ships got lost. So I think it could be selective. I think there could be some remnants. My personal opinion is I think there's um, remnants of a, an older civilization down there that, it, you know, their their argument is for, for the rules of this world. It's like, yeah, you know what? It, you know, we're not breaking protocol. These are these are lone boats, lone planes. Like, yeah, we're gonna grab a couple here here and there, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know, how, whatever you know the 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 whatever they're using, be it some dimensional gateway, or I mean, it it's extremely disorienting. So it doesn't surprise me. But yeah, I think. What if, what? If, go ahead. Go on then. Sorry. No, you're good. Uh, the other thing I was, was going to ask you, I just found this all really fascinating, mm -hmm. is so if the flat Earth. And very simply, it's flat. Do you think what? What's your thoughts on the hollow earth theory? Then is that something that you've been pulled to as well? Oh yeah, yeah. That's how I got into flat earth. Was was hollow earth? I was a huge hollow earth fan. Huge because it, it again intriguing, and I got into that back in oh wow, late nineties, early two thousands, to where I I was even poking around Mount Shasta, California. Uh, you know, with with my girlfriend at the time, because it was like, oh, you know, there could be, you know, entrances here and there, and the the hollow. But does does I do I think that flat Earth has any problem with hollow Earth? No, and the reason is is because of how little space we use. Meaning, most of our civilization exists. You know, ninety something percent of our of our civilization lives between sea level and uh, um, a couple kilometers up. I'm going to actually yeah. say kilometers for you guys, even though you don't use miles. <laughs> we you know, I, don't miles. Generally do I don't generally do that, but for you, I will, because, you know, UK. So, <laughs> um, so if most of the population lives in this narrow band, right, you know, the commercial airplanes cap out at about uh, 50,000 feet, um, cap out, meaning they can't really go any higher. Um, spy planes, maybe double that. Then you could have a, you know, a cavern that's only... I don't know, 10 20 miles high that that could hold you know huge amounts of of people if, if you wanted to and so who's to say that maybe we aren't in one as well so no hollow earth theory everything every other conspiracy you can think of dovetails very very well into um flat earth with the exception of um the the fake space program and that there are like a million people living on the moon but no i love hollow earth i, I think it's great I mean, I don't, I don't know if don't know if Mark, if you heard, hmm. but uh, recently I think they found this, and this is again, it is how little we all know about the Earth because just in the early nineties they found this massive cave. I mean, talk about massive that is about twenty miles long, 
Sure. And it has it and it has its own weather system. This is how big this cave is. And that is in Vietnam. So they're finding things 20 years. And what's the things? Did you see that massive crystal cave that they found? Yeah, in, I think it was in America, Mexico. So there are things. How can we say anything's for certain? Let's question things. This is why we're having these conversations because we don't know anything for certain, do we? Really? No, we don't. <clears throat> and that dovetails into um, my my poking of science, where you have um, you know we've all seen the the core. You know what does the core of the Earth look like, right? And you see you know the cross sections with the 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 orange and the yellow and the or the red the orange the yellow and the white you know thing in the center and it's but most again most people don't realize the deepest hole ever drilled is about 12 kilometers it was done by the germans and the russians they could not get past that depth could not do it it's like okay that's barely you know a tiny fraction of of, of what it would take to drill to the core so how are you showing this this and in fine print if you look in wiki and different sciences, you know, the scientists will say, well, we're extrapolating from volcanic and blah. But truth is, we really have no idea what's down there. It's like, then why are you showing us this? It's because th that's what science does. Science puts there, it's like, this is our best guess, stamp. They, you know, they're never going to put a question mark on it. And um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who, but all, Brian Cox would probably say the same thing, which is, by the way, there's only three media scientists in the world, if you guys didn't know. Uh, Neil deGrasse from our side, Brian Cox from your side, uh, Michio Kaku from Japan. That's it. Those are the only guys they put on television when it comes to major, major scientists. And things. But Neil said that science is right whether or not you believe in it. And it's one of the most arrogant things I've ever heard in his life. What he's basically saying is like, if we say it's true, it's true. Yeah. But then, but then something comes along that completely blows it out of the water, and then they just re, you know, change the definition. It's like, okay, this is the new truth. It's like you're not going to apologize for the for the first thing. It's like, nope, we're not. This is we're science. We don't apologize for anything. Um, which is why, and I, I usually poke at them with the easy stuff like um, cryptozoology, which is uh, animals that uh, that they think are myths until they can actually get one in a lab, right? Mm -hmm. So the giant panda. Science just laughed. It's like a giant bear, a black and white bear that only eats bamboo. Oh, that's a great one. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, here, here's one right here. Um, or the giant anaconda or the giant squid. You know, they 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 keep doing the same thing. It's so my quote is, is the science right until they're not? Right. You I know? mean, I mean, you look you're looking at human evolu or evolution or hu you know. Uh, another thing they've just found, I think, in Russia or parts of Asia, the new fragments of bone, another species of the human species, right. a species that wasn't like the human. So I think there are things we can't say while, well, you know, science does this, puts a stamp on something and says, right, you now that's going to be taught like right. the pyramids were built by slaves no it wasn't built by slaves you know right. we can't we have to expand this is this is the expansion of our consciousness you know when they say about uh, humans that we're only been on this planet five thousand years i don't think so we've been in millions of years yeah. i I, th I think we've got to shove these scientists out the way and bring the real people in <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice it's a nice thought i made a video called um the the code of credibility which is anyone in a white lab coat we've been conditioned to like like the police officer uniform or the fire department when you wear a light white lab coats you are immediately given more credibility immediately i mean it's like oh well that's obviously a smart person saying everything um to your point about the the pyramids by the way i my one visit to the pyramids was because i had heard i had read that if you go there and stand at the base of it, you re and you realize that it absolutely has nothing to do with us. And that was absolutely true. I, I went there and I stared, but it wasn't for the reason I thought. It was because I spun around and you people say, oh, you know, you see the pictures of the pyramids and there's this desert, right? But it's not 360 desert. I mean, Cairo is backed up right to, I mean, the, the parking lot, which is right next to the pyramids, right? Because it's this huge tourism thing. I mean, there's a Starbucks within like a golf shot of the pyramid. Yeah, there is. <laughs> but you look at Cairo, if you go through, drive through Cairo, you realize, I'm not picking on the Egyptians. I mean, you know, the wonderful culture, but you realize they had nothing to do with the building of that at all. And it's like, yeah, you guys didn't have a freaking chance because if you could build this, you'd be way better off than you are now. 
what I my my theory was so one of the pharaohs back in the day, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you do this? If you're a pharaoh sending out recon teams, you find those things and what I think was a lion that they cha- you know carved the head down into a into one of the pharaohs. You show up, it's like you look around, no one here. Yeah, we built this. <laughs> And you take credit for it. And within a generation, you are elevated to near God status. Because why wouldn't you? It's like the, the people around you, they have no concept. And it's and it's part of its loss. It's like there isn't a single single hieroglyph that describes the building of the pyramids. Not one. And then yet to this day, you know, people, oh yeah, it's logs and all a bunch of slaves. It's like they're engineers that'll tell you right this second that we had nothing to do with. But I, I still, to this day, I don't think that, um, I think Machu Picchu and Puma Punku, even though they're much, much smaller, are um, from an engineering framework, are, are way more impressive. Than, I well, mean, yeah. some, of, some, of, some of the pyramids in South America are actually bigger oh, yeah. than the Pyramid of Giza, only because they, they're some, they buried some of the stuff. And yeah. there's pyramids, and there's pyramids that they've not even found yet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the Bosnian pyramids, they're trying to do what they can there, but so much crap on top of them. It would take forever to, to get it off. But And even if they did, then then you've got scientists trying to figure, you know, they're going to have to make up stuff. By the way, let me throw one, throw one more thing. They will make up things if they're backed into a corner. Um, the, the, the I brought up many times uh, the coelacanth fish. If you ever, you know, C-O-E-L-A-C-A-N-T-H. Which is an ugly fish with a whole bunch of extra fins, right? And every scientist knew that it was been extinct for at least 70 million years. Absolutely would have bet the freaking farm on it. Every single scientist in the world. And then the British Navy caught one off of South Africa uh, in 1940. And then another one off of Madagascar, and then another one off of Mozambique. And then all of a sudden it's like, wow, there's a whole bunch of these things around Africa. And then National Geographic is swimming. But science was in trouble. Because they're like, well, okay, uh, what do we do? So they had to make up stuff. They they said, oh, well, it's obviously a living fossil. What does that even mean? Well, it's a term we have now. And uh, and it's in an evolutionary state of stasis. Oh, you mean it hasn't evolved in 70 million years? Yeah, that's what we're saying. It's like, what? Anyway, so... <laughs> It's just, uh, it's a, just been an amazing conversation. This, I, I feel like there's so many points I keep mentally uh, taking notes, saying I must look at that after. I must look at that after. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of our listeners are going to be doing that, and I, I think that's great. Uh, you know, we're we're opening the spectrum of our thoughts here, yeah. uh, and and that is certainly a big passion about what we try and do here on that this podcast. Cool. Uh, and I, I really thank you for so many of your answers there, Mark, because they've been, I feel like you took us on a journey. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, yeah. There's a lot of content, but the, um, the, what I try to reinforce to people is that the big one is don't believe everything at face value. You know, yeah. it, there's so many, look, it's a world. <sighs> It's a wonderful world, but it's a world which is based on a lot of layers of deception. Um, people in power love, you know, they, they protect their own. Um, what, what I try to get to, to people is everyone's got their own wheelhouse, their own comfort zone, right? Everybody believes, you know, I, I've, I've tried to work backwards on people. It's like, oh, so, no, so nobody ever lies anywhere about anything. There are no conspiracies. It's like, well, no, I'm sure there are a few. It's like, yeah. Yeah, there are. I could spend an entire day on, um, I mean, we all know there's lies in, and conspiracies in business and politics and sports and entertainment. And yeah, even journalism and science happens all the time. It's just that what people are comfortable with, the, they, they tend to get too complacent with the media in that the media doesn't report on conspiracies. They re- label them. So if it's a big lie, it's a scandal. You guys love doing. I mean, you guys love covering scandals, but if somebody <laughs> yeah. dies, somebody dies during that lie, then it's a tragedy. But if yeah. it's an un, if it's an unproven lie, then it's a conspiracy. And I was like, okay, so basically, there's media sanctioned conspiracies, and then there's everything else. You know, there's and again, it's like, look, the media is owned by companies which are owned by bigger companies, go with you know bigger, bigger parent conglomerates, and they all have their own interests. And they're not yeah, going to. They're not going to hurt. We, 
It's what we'd right. call just a, it's a narrative, like a yeah. story that's being told to us. Um, yeah. A little bit like you mentioned at the beginning, uh, when we're in the classroom and we're seeing the globe, you know, where you are, you see the US flag or all these things conditioning, uh, oh, yeah. even, even woven within some of our stories, you know, and, and you could, but you could look at it the other way. There's also truth woven in some things like Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. <laughs> that I've looked at a few quotes from that at the moment that there's there's little clues there. I have a I have a challenge for for your listeners, which is because I'm now hyper aware of it, and I've seen it in British shows and American shows and Australian shows and, and a lot of English speaking shows. Which is if no matter what show you are watching, if it's not directly space related, like Star Wars or Close Encounters or something like that, you will inevitably find a globe in frame in just about every one of them. And you're saying, no, no, it's like, no, no, no. I'm hyper aware of it. It doesn't matter if it's a show from 30 years ago or, or, or a show, a premiere, you know, a show I just watched last week, which is, I heard rumors about this. I don't want to drag this out, but I've heard rumors that if you guys know anything about the entertainment industry, if you're a, pro you can become a producer just by giving money to a show. You can walk into any set there is and say, I want to spend, I want to donate $40,000 to your television program or movie. And they're like, all right, what do you want for it? You want your name in the credits? What do you want? Because that's all really all it takes to be a producer. And there are people that go in, it's like, I would like to help set this scene. I would like, you know, whatever it is. And, and, they, and, and they look and it's like, all right, fine. And then you go in there and you put a globe in and, you know, a couple other little things and the director doesn't care because they'll take your money. And the globe, it's, what's controversial about that? It's benign. And it's like, okay, fine. Yeah, I get every classroom has to have, every public classroom has to have a, a, a globe somewhere. But why is there a globe in that doctor's office? Why is there a globe in that billionaire's office? Why is there a globe on top of that filing cabinet of a detective in Chicago? Right, the whole room's a freaking mess, and there's a globe. What does that detective need the globe? What's it up there for? But and it's not just like a passing shot; it's in frame for for quite a while. And again, it's brilliant in that for ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars. I mean, that's cheap. You can you can do this, and and the the more popular the show, and you're taking you're taking the gamble because those sets don't change. So if the show runs for five seasons, that office doesn't change for five years. And you're like, yeah. yeah, that was a sweet investment. Other ones was like, uh, died in the pilot. Uh, who cares? We'll just print more money. So it's and that is subtle conditioning. It is it is absolutely mm -hmm. wonderful. It, they've gotten they've gotten people, but a lot of people have broken out. You know, our members are. Everywhere. I was gonna, I was going to ask you about that, Mark, because it's yeah. a really good sort of question to finish off the podcast. Is that yeah. this, there are? It does seem. You know, a lot of people I call waking up, or I call starting to question that narrative uh, we yeah. call you know our podcast called collective awakening because people in my opinion our opinion are awakening in some form and we're not saying for one minute what we are saying is right but we're creating a platform that enables people to have that expression that opinion because we you know you put the tv on it's just that one story that one narrative but right. more people are waking up why do you think that is Oh, uh, if I had to take a guess, um, two twofold. One would be that they're allowing it. You know, if you if you take the 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 Sin the Illuminati side of things, they're probably allowing it to happen because they want some change to take place. But the other is is that the sto our story, our civilization, is kind of run its course, um, and we're in Act Three now, and we're kind of in this state of flux. Meaning every great story has has three acts, right? Um, first act, you set up the characters. Second act, you give them a challenge. And third act, it resolves one way or the other. And that's kind of where we are. Uh, you know, we're in the middle of, well, pandemic aside, there's uh, there's all sorts of fun things that are happening out there. And uh, we're, in fact, my next podcast is going to be called Clowntastic because it's just, the stories are just so out there right now. Um, but it's, I, But I think it's inevitable. I think every society wakes up. To, maybe that's part of the plan. Uh, I now not everybody. I do believe, and it's another story for another time. Um, the NPCs, you know, zombies basically walking around that don't have anything inside them. Um, but you know, the our if our civilization lasted five thousand years before it woke up, I say that's actually pretty good. Babylonians didn't last long at all. 
you know, they immediately started building the bridge. It's like, yeah, let's do this. And then that, that, that it didn't go well. But uh, yeah, I think it's just part of the, part of the cycle. Us waking up. I'm that's, that's what I'm hoping anyway. Yeah. So that was really interesting there, Mark, because it, perhaps maybe Chris as well, maybe you want to chip in here is that maybe, you know, if everything's happening for a reason and people are starting to question, I call stepping stones, humanity part of the awakening as part of shedding the old, we we have to start questioning things. And as maybe um, the idea for the powers to be is stepping stone to this new uh, reality that maybe we will step out of this globe and step into a higher purpose that's why i'm sort of leaning towards I, a, a, new, a new earth a new earth i'm totally there with you um i'm a big believer in uh that this world feels like a school in a lot of aspects you know it can only be one of three things a uh, prison planet which <laughs> doesn't make any sense because it's it's a very nice prison planet uh entertainment but if that was the case there's a lot of people that aren't that entertained um in school you know where you're here it's somewhat entertaining and kind of you're locked in but you're learning stuff along the way but eventually the the class has to graduate and another one has to come in and when you graduate you know like like a lot of things like yeah you don't have to go home but you gotta get the hell out of here because we have a whole new group coming in and i think you know the the whoever makes it to the you know the the next stage they're told it's like oh yeah by the way don't mess with the new class don't mess with them <laughs> you know you can you know, hang, you need to hang out with the Bermuda Triangle guys if you really want to. But <laughs> for the most part, we've won. <laughs> oh, well, um, I just want to thank you, Mark, for yeah. joining us and just everything you've shared. Um, um, it's been absolutely fascinating. And all I want to say to our listeners is you decide. We've, we've, we've shared this information and Mark's uh, been so kind to join us and give his time to share this so look into it for yourself see what sits right for you that's what it's all about have the conversation and 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 feel your way through it but i i found it absolutely fascinating and what i've found interesting mark is there's been quite a bit of wisdom that i can really resonate behind it if that makes cool. sense when you well, talk about reality and this earth being a school and many things we really resonate with and talk about so it's all happened for a reason, us coming together. And I'd love to do it again if you'd like to come back sometime. I would be happy to. And yeah. if, or even if, if you're over here in person, you're welcome to come and visit us. It, we, you know what? I, I, I may be able to. But I mean, I, as far as I know, the restrictions aren't bad now. Coming over here is a whole other thing. But yeah, if anyone yeah. wants to find any of my stuff, just Google Flat Earth Mark. Yeah, That's and it. we'll uh, we'll post some links uh, with everybody uh, listening or watching us where we can connect with Mark. Uh, just thanks so much, everybody, for listening. And thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. It, it's been uh, – I've really enjoyed it. I, I could thank go you. on for another hour, really, but we're going to save it. We're going to save it for another time. <laughs> okay. Uh, and let everybody digest uh, a lot of that information. So thanks so much. Until we speak again, goodbye, everyone. Thank you for watching the Collective Awakening podcast. For more information on the Purple Mountain Spiritual and Wellbeing Centre, you can visit our website at thepurplemountain.co.uk and don't forget to click and subscribe.